The Paris Catacombs are a labyrinth of underground pathways and corridors housing the remains of over 6 million people beneath the city. There are a ton of legends and ghost stories associated with the catacombs. One of the more well-known stories involves an unidentified man. Footage was discovered in the catacombs, capturing the final moments where a panicked man ran off into the dark, never to be seen again. The legend begins in the early 1990s when a group of cataphiles, explorers who delve into the hidden parts of the catacombs, reportedly discovered an abandoned video camera. The camera contained footage that would soon become infamous. It showed a man whose identity remains unknown, wandering deeper and deeper into the catacombs until he started becoming more and more manic. The footage ends abruptly as the man drops the camera and runs off into the darkness, never to be seen again. The footage presents a first-person view of the man's journey in the catacombs. The video begins with him confidently navigating the tunnels. As he progresses, his demeanor changes. He films skeletal remains and eerie passages and at one point picks up a skull. The atmosphere becomes increasingly tense, culminating in the man's frantic sprint and suddenly dropping the camera. There is a lot of debate on whether or not the footage is genuine. While there are many people who think that man's reactions are real, skeptics say that it was all an act. They believe that it might be a well-crafted hoax designed to capitalize on the catacombs' already disturbing reputation. Today, the location serves as a popular, albeit unsettling, tourist attraction. Only a small portion is open to the public, with the rest remaining largely unexplored and illegal to access without special permission. This restricted access only adds to the allure for urban explorers, or cataphiles, who often enter the catacombs through hidden entrances and navigate the tunnels despite the dangers. Exploring the catacombs can have severe psychological effects. The labyrinthine tunnels, pervasive darkness, and the constant presence of death can lead to disorientation, anxiety, and even hallucinations. The man in the footage appears to experience these symptoms, which may explain his panic and sudden disappearance. Studies on sensory deprivation and isolation indicate that such environments can significantly impair cognitive function and mental stability, making the catacombs a particularly treacherous place for the unprepared. The Oak Grove Jane Doe case began on April 12, 1946, when three individuals walking along the shore of the Willamette River near Oak Grove, Oregon, discovered a burlap sack floating near the bank. For whatever reason, the three told reporters that they initially thought it might contain drowned kittens, but upon opening it, they found the torso of a woman along with some clothes. Just one day after the torso was found, on April 13th, two fishermen made another grim discovery about six miles away from the site of the torso. They found a burlap package floating against the lock system in Willamette Falls. This package contained both arms of the victim and the right thigh. Something to note was that the hands and feet were missing from these limbs. The package was similarly wrapped to the one containing the torso, using burlap and bound with telephone wire. It was also weighed down with window sash weights, indicating a deliberate attempt to sink the remains. Interestingly, the fishermen later reported that they had actually noticed this package about 30 days earlier but had assumed it was just trash. It wasn't until they heard news reports about the torso discovery that they realized the significance of what they had seen and reported it to the authorities. Several months passed before the next significant discovery. In July 1946, two separate but related discoveries were made. The victim's left thigh was discovered near the Oregon City Bridge. This location is in the same general area as the previous discoveries, suggesting that the killer may have disposed of the body parts in multiple locations along the river. On July 2nd of the same year, a bundle of women's clothing was found in the Clackamas River. This discovery expanded the search area and suggested that the culprit might have used multiple waterways to dispose of evidence. The clothing found included brown slacks, a dark blue sweater, long union suit underwear, and a grayish black tweed top coat. In September, a small but major discovery was made. Fragments of what appeared to be human scalp were found near Willamette Falls. While these fragments were small, they provided investigators with additional physical evidence and potentially some hair samples that could be used for analysis. 
The final major discovery in this case came on October 13th, when the victim's severed head was found. This discovery was made near the original location where the torso had been found six months earlier. It was found by a married couple. The fact that it was found near the original torso discovery site suggests that the killer may have returned to the area or that water currents played a role in the distribution of body parts. The head was found missing certain parts, and it provided investigators with a more accurate estimation of the victim's age. Again, despite finding all of these remains, the hands and feet were never located. Investigators tend to believe that the person responsible had actually destroyed those remains. Thus, they will never be found. However, many officials think that there may be smaller bits of undiscovered physical evidence still out there. Based on the evidence officials have, officials stated that the victim is female and estimated to have been in her late teens to early 20s. However, after the discovery of the head and further examination, Dr. Warren Hunter, a pathologist from the University of Oregon, significantly changed the estimate. The current consensus suggests her age is between 30 and 59 years old, with most sources narrowing it to 40 to 50 years old. The victim was Caucasian and believed to be 5 foot 2 or 5 foot 4 inches tall and about 120 pounds. She had brown and graying hair, but it was found in curlers and pins, which led to investigators believing that the victim was preparing for some sort of event before her death. No eye color was shared since she was discovered without them. Dr. Warren Hunter noted burn marks on the lower portion of the torso, which led him to believe that the woman may have been tortured before her death. This information might suggest a personal motive or a particularly sadistic perpetrator. Back on April 14, 1946, just two days after the discovery of the torso, a 29-year-old man named Orville A. Switzer contacted the police, claiming to quote-unquote know all about the torso murder case. This lead initially seemed promising, as Switzer claimed to know both the identity of the victim and the location where she had been dismembered. However, upon investigation, authorities quickly determined that Switzer's call was a hoax. He was arrested, but released shortly after, when it became clear he had no actual connection to the crime. Interestingly, a few days after his release, Switzer was arrested again on vagrancy charges and received a 270-day jail sentence, suggesting he may have been seeking attention or notoriety through his false claim. Investigators found a set of size 10 men's footprints near the river where some of the remains were discovered. While this provided a potential lead, it's unclear how thoroughly this evidence was pursued or whether it yielded any significant information. The presence of these footprints suggests that the killer may have revisited the dump site, although this remains speculative. In an attempt to determine the initial drop-off point of the body parts, authorities analyzed the speed and current of the Willamette River. This analysis aimed to provide insight into how long the body had been submerged and potentially narrowed down the area where the killer might have disposed of the remains. However, the results of this analysis and its impact on the investigation are said to be inconclusive. In July 1951, five years after the discovery of the Oak Grove Jane Doe, the FBI interviewed a convicted murderer named Roy Moore. Roy provided a detailed account of murdering and dismembering a woman, claiming he had disposed of her body in the Malala River. This confession initially seemed promising, as it shared similarities with the Oak Grove Jane Doe case. However, several factors cast doubt on Roy's involvement. He claimed to have disposed of the remains in the Malala River, not the Willamette River, where the Oak Grove Jane Doe was found. And despite the detailed confession, investigators were unable to find any physical evidence linking him to the Oak Grove Jane Doe case. Furthermore, many convicted killers falsely confessed to crimes in order to try and get reduced time, or they just liked to toy with people. It's said that Roy had previously falsely confessed to other cases, so it's definitely possible he did the same here. Ultimately, no concrete connection to the Jane Doe was made. One of the most intriguing theories in recent years involves a woman named Anna Schrader. She was a married Portland woman who disappeared around the same time as the discovery of the Oak Grove Jane Doe. This theory, proposed by Oregon-based authors J.D. Chandler and Joshua Fisher, brought up several interesting connections. The first is that Schrader's disappearance coincided closely with the estimated time of death of the Oak Grove Jane Doe. She had been involved in a scandalous affair with a married police lieutenant, potentially providing a 
motive for her murder if the affair had gone sour, or if she possessed incriminating information. Given Schrader's connection to the police department, some have speculated that her murder could have been covered up by law enforcement, explaining the lack of progress in the investigation. While detailed physical descriptions of her are limited, what is known about her age and general appearance does not rule out a match with the Oak Grove Jane Doe. Despite these arguments, the Schrader theory remains speculative. Jerusalem Syndrome is a rare psychiatric phenomenon that includes religiously themed obsessive ideas, delusions, or psychoses triggered by a visit to the city of Jerusalem. While its triggers are varied, the syndrome is particularly notable for the sudden and intense nature of its symptoms, often affecting individuals without any prior history of mental illness. Jerusalem Syndrome first gained a clinical recognition through the work of Dr. Yair Barel, who, during his tenure as the director of the Kafar Shaw Psychiatric Hospital studied numerous cases of tourists experiencing acute psychotic episodes in Jerusalem. Between 1979 and 1993, Bar-El analyzed 470 individuals, noting that the syndrome affected tourists from diverse religious backgrounds, predominantly Jews and Christians, with a small percentage having no religious affiliation. Jerusalem syndrome can manifest through a variety of symptoms, typically progressing through three distinct phases. The initial phase involves involves a sense of unease and anxiety, often accompanied by a need for solitude and ritual purification, such as frequent bathing. In the second phase, individuals may become fixated on religious themes and display behaviors consistent with their delusions. This can include dressing in white robes or other biblical attire and engaging in public preaching or sermons. The final phase involves the development of delusional beliefs, where individuals may identify themselves as religious figures such as Jesus, the Virgin Mary, or prophets. This can lead to actions driven by these delusions, often causing significant distress and disruption. Barel and his colleagues identified three primary types of Jerusalem Syndrome, which are classified based on the individual's psychiatric history and the nature of their symptoms. Type 1. Superimposed on previous psychosis. This type affects individuals with a known history of mental illness. The visit to Jerusalem exacerbates their existing condition, leading to an acute episode. Type 2. Psychotic identifications. This type occurs in individuals with an underlying mental condition that becomes apparent during their visit to Jerusalem. The environment and religious significance of the city trigger their latent psychosis. Type 3. No previous mental illness. The most intriguing type, this affects individuals with no prior history of psychiatric issues. They develop psychotic symptoms directly related to their experience in Jerusalem. This type is further divided into pure cases, where the psychosis is strictly confined to their time in Jerusalem and resolves upon departure. Several theories have been proposed to explain Jerusalem Syndrome, emphasizing the combination of psychological, cultural, and environmental factors. These include psychological stress, cultural and religious influence, and factors such as sensory overload from the crowded, historically rich surroundings. The tragic deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives, commonly referred to as the Boys on the Tracks case, remain one of the more controversial unsolved mysteries in Arkansas history. This case involves the deaths of two teenagers who were found on train tracks in Alexander, Arkansas in 1987. Over the years, the case has attracted numerous theories, allegations of cover-ups, and connections to larger criminal activities. Don and Kevin were typical teenagers growing up in Bryant, Arkansas. Don was known for his love of hunting and the outdoors, while Kevin was described as a friendly and outgoing young man with a passion for sports. Both boys were well-liked in their community and had bright futures ahead of them. The mid-1980s in Arkansas were marked by growing concerns over drug trafficking, particularly with the state's connection to the notorious Medellin cartel through the operations of Barry Seal, a pilot involved in smuggling cocaine. Seal's activities centered around Mena, Arkansas, which would later become a focal point in the investigations surrounding the boys' deaths. On the evening of August 22, 1987, Don and Kevin left their homes in with plans to go night hunting. This was a common activity for the two teenagers, who often hunted deer and other small game in the wooded areas around their community. Don, aged 16, and Kevin, aged 17, were equipped with flashlights and Don's 22 caliber rifle as they headed out around midnight. 
They walked along the railroad tracks that cut through the woods, a familiar route for them. What occurred during their hunting trip remains shrouded in mystery, but it is widely believed that they may have stumbled upon something they were not supposed to see. At around 4.25 a.m. on August 23, 1987, a 75-car Union Pacific cargo train was making its regular run to Little Rock, Arkansas. The train's engineer, Stephen Schroyer, spotted two motionless bodies lying side by side on the tracks covered by a green tarp. Schroyer immediately initiated emergency braking procedures, but the train was unable to stop in time and ran over the boys, dragging their bodies for nearly a mile. Schroyer and his crew were shaken, so they immediately reported the incident to local authorities. Upon arrival at the scene, law enforcement officers found the bodies of Don Henry and Kevin Ives severely mutilated by the train. The presence of a green tarp over their bodies raised immediate suspicions about the nature of their deaths as it suggested an attempt to conceal them on the tracks. The initial investigation into the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives was conducted by local law enforcement and the Saline County Sheriff's Office. Dr. Fahmi Malak, the state medical examiner, performed the first autopsy on the boys. Malak's report concluded that the deaths were accidental, attributing them to extreme marijuana intoxication. According to his findings, the boys had smoked the equivalent of 20 marijuana cigarettes and had fallen asleep on the tracks, oblivious to the approaching train. This conclusion was met with immediate skepticism and outrage from the boys' families. Linda Ives and Curtis Henry, the boys' parents, were particularly vocal in their disbelief. They knew their sons well and found it implausible that they would have consumed such an excessive amount of marijuana or that they would have lain down on the tracks in such a vulnerable position. Critics pointed out that the level of marijuana claimed to have been consumed by the boys would have likely incapacitated them to the point of severe physiological effects far beyond mere unconsciousness. This aspect of the findings was particularly contentious given the relatively high tolerance needed for such effects which the boys were not known to possess. Further Furthermore, the presence of a green tarp over the bodies suggested an attempt to conceal them, contradicting the idea of an accidental death due to intoxication. This discrepancy was not addressed in Malik's report, leading to further doubts about the thoroughness and accuracy of his examination. Due to mounting pressure from the families and the public, a second autopsy was conducted by Dr. James Garriott, a forensic pathologist from San Antonio. Dr. Garriott's findings starkly contrasted with those of Dr. Malak. He reported that the boys had smoked a far lesser amount of marijuana, equivalent to one or two joints, not 20. This level of marijuana would not have rendered them unconscious, thereby invalidating the initial conclusion of accidental death due to intoxication. Dr. Garriott's findings suggested that the boys were conscious and aware of their surroundings, thereby negating the possibility that they had simply fallen asleep on the tracks. This significant divergence from the original autopsy report fueled suspicions that there was more to the boys' deaths than initially reported. The families, particularly Linda Ives, felt vindicated by these new findings as they corroborated their belief that the boys had not been incapacitated by drugs. The third autopsy, performed by Dr. Joseph Burton, a forensic pathologist from Atlanta, uncovered even more critical evidence. Dr. Burton discovered that Don Henry had been stabbed in the back, and Kevin Ives had sustained a crushing blow to the head, likely inflicted by the butt of Don's rifle. These injuries were clear indications of foul play and suggested that the boys were incapacitated or already dead before being placed on the tracks. Dr. Burton's autopsy findings led to the reclassification of the boys' deaths from accidental to homicide. The discovery of these injuries directly contradicted Dr. Malik's original findings and provided concrete evidence that the boys had been attacked prior to their deaths. This revelation intensified the calls for a thorough investigation into the circumstances surrounding their deaths and potential involvement of others. The new autopsy findings prompted a grand jury investigation. The grand jury reviewed the evidence, including testimonies from various witnesses, and concluded that the deaths were indeed homicides. This reclassification was a critical turning point in the case, as it shifted the focus from accidental death to deliberate murder, necessitating a more in-depth investigation into potential suspects and motives. Dr. Malik's handling of the autopsy was not the first time his work had come under scrutiny. He had a history of controversial rulings and had faced criticism for other cases where his conclusions were questioned. This pattern of questionable findings cast further doubt on the integrity of his work in the Henry and Ives case. 
The implications of the autopsy findings extended beyond medical conclusions. Allegations surfaced suggesting that local law enforcement and political figures were involved in a cover-up to protect larger drug trafficking operations. The involvement of Dan Harmon, a local prosecutor later convicted of drug-related crimes, added credibility to these allegations. Harmon's role in the investigation and subsequent criminal activities raised questions about the extent to which local authorities were complicit in or actively obstructing justice justice in the case. In the years following the initial investigations, several independent investigations were conducted by private detectives, journalists, and concerned citizens. These investigations aimed to uncover the truth behind the autopsy findings and the broader context of the boys' deaths. They often faced significant obstacles, including resistance from local officials and threats against those seeking to reveal new information. Gene Duffy, head of the Sailing County Drug Task Force, became a key figure in pursuing the truth behind the boys' deaths. Duffy's task force uncovered evidence of widespread drug trafficking and corruption involving local officials. However, her efforts were met with intense opposition, leading to her eventual forced departure from Arkansas. Duffy's findings supported the theory that the boys had witnessed a drug drop and were murdered to prevent them from revealing what they had seen. In 2018, former professional wrestler Billy Jack Haynes came forward with a confession that added another layer of complexity to the case. Haynes claimed he had witnessed the murders of Don Henry and Kevin Ives and had been involved in the drug operation that led to their deaths. According to Haynes, the boys were killed after stumbling upon a drug drop and their murders were orchestrated by local officials to cover up the illegal activities. While his confession has been met with skepticism, it reignited public interest and speculation about the true nature of the boys' deaths. The disappearance of the Sarah Joe and its crew in 1979, followed by the discovery of the vessel nearly a decade later, is one of the most intriguing maritime mysteries. Hana, a small town on the eastern end of Maui, Hawaii, is known for being a remote and close-knit community. Fishing has always been a significant part of Hana's culture and economy. Many of the town's residents relied on the sea for their livelihoods. Over time, this led to a deep connection with the ocean. The Sarah Joe was a small, 17-foot Boston whaler, which is a common vessel used by local fishermen. These boats are known for their durability and versatility. The crew of the Sarah Joe were experienced fishermen who had grown up around the sea and were well versed in its potential dangers. On February 11th, 1979, five men from Hana set out on the Sarah Joe for what was intended to be a routine fishing trip. The crew included 38-year-old Benjamin Kalama, Ralph Malayakini, Scott Mormon, both of whom were 27, 31-year-old Peter Hanchett, and 26-year-old Patrick Wozner. The Sarah Joe left the Hana Harbor early in the morning under clear skies, but as the day progressed, an unexpected and violent storm swept through the area. The sudden change in weather caught many off guard, including the Sarah Joe's crew. Despite their experience, the storm proved to be overwhelming. When the Sarah Joe and its crew failed to return, a massive search and rescue operation was launched. The U.S. Coast Guard, along with numerous volunteers from the community, covered thousands of square miles of ocean over the following days. The search included aerial reconnaissance, surface vessels, and divers, but no trace of the boat or its crew was found. The violent storm that hit the waters off Maui on February 11, 1979 was unexpected. The Sarah Joe was not prepared for such severe weather conditions. The storm was described as powerful and fast-moving, bringing with it high winds, heavy rain, and rough seas. Local fishermen reported waves reaching heights of 30 feet, which would have posed a significant challenge to any small vessel. As the storm intensified, the conditions on the water became increasingly dangerous. The visibility dropped and the seas became choppy and unpredictable. The Sarah Joe, like other small boats, would have struggled to navigate through such treacherous conditions. Despite the crew's experience and knowledge of the ocean, the storm was just way too overwhelming. Despite the intensity and scale of the search, no trace of the Sarah Joe or its crew was found. There were no pieces of debris, no signals, and no sightings reported. The ocean seemed to have swallowed the boat and its crew without leaving any clues. The lack of evidence was frustrating and heartbreaking for the search teams and the families of the missing men. As days turned into weeks, hopes of finding the crew alive dwindled. 
The search was officially called off after five days, leaving the fate of the Sarah Joe and its crew a mystery. Nearly a decade after the Sarah Joe and its crew vanished, a significant development emerged that reignited interest and speculation in the case. On September 10th, 1988, John Naughton, a marine biologist who had participated in the original search for the Sarah Joe, stumbled upon the wreckage of the boat while conducting a wildlife survey on Taungi Atoll, part of the Marshall Islands. However, this discovery, over 2,000 miles from Hawaii, raised more questions than it answered. During the survey, Naughton noticed a small boat wrecked on the shore. Upon closer inspection, he identified it as the Sarah Joe. The boat's registration number and other identities identifying marks confirmed its identity, despite years of exposure to the harsh elements. The Sarah Joe was found in a surprisingly intact condition, considering it had been adrift for nearly a decade. The boat's fiberglass hull showed signs of wear and tear, typical of prolonged exposure to salt water and the elements, but it was not severely damaged. This relatively preserved state suggested that the boat had not been violently capsized or destroyed, as might be expected from such a long journey through turbulent seas. The condition of the boat also indicated it might have been carried by ocean currents rather than being directly battered by storms. A more disturbing find awaited Naughton and his team near the boat. About 100 yards from the Sarah Joe, they discovered a shallow grave marked by a makeshift cross constructed from driftwood. The grave contained human remains, which were later identified as those of Scott Mormon through dental records. The condition and arrangement of the grave suggested a deliberate and respectful burial, raising immediate questions about who had buried Scott and under what circumstances inside the grave alongside the remains were sheets of paper with tin foil. This detail intrigued investigators and researchers as it hinted at possible ritualistic or cultural burial practices. The presence of these items suggested that the grave might have been prepared by individuals familiar with certain burial customs, potentially those from Asian cultures where such practices are known. The paper and tinfoil could be Joss papers, traditionally burned or buried in Chinese funerary customs to ensure good fortune for the deceased in the afterlife. As I said earlier, this discovery created more questions rather than provide answers. The first question is how exactly did the Sarah Joe travel over 2,000 miles while maintaining a relatively intact condition? We also have no idea about the survival of the rest of the crew. The grave implied that at least one person might have survived for some time after the boat went missing. This survivor might have buried Scott Mormon before succumbing to the elements. However, no other remains were found on the atoll and the fate of the other four crew members remains unknown. Over the years, several theories have emerged to explain the events leading up to the discovery of the Sarah Joe and Mormon's grave. As we have touched on earlier, it's possible that the boat simply drifted across the ocean, carrying at least one survivor. Another theory involves the possibility that the Sarah Joe was found by illegal fishermen, possibly from China or Taiwan. These fishermen might have buried Scott according to their customs, using Joss paper and a makeshift cross. The decision not to report the discovery could stem from their illegal activities in the area. The Publius Enigma mystery began in 1994, coinciding with the release of Pink Floyd's album The Division Bell, and has since captivated fans, cryptographers, and conspiracy theorists alike. It was during this period that cryptic messages started appearing on the Usenet newsgroup Alt Music Pink Floyd, posted by a user under the name Publius. These posts hinted at a hidden puzzle within the album that promised a reward for those who could decipher it. The first known message from Publius was posted on June 11th, 1994. It said the following, My friends, you have heard the message Pink Floyd has delivered, but you still do not know what it means. Find the answer. This will prove to be a great reward, one that we have given you, the fans. You will not be disappointed. This message sparked curiosity among the fans, but the subsequent posts truly engaged the community. Publius provided further details suggesting that the puzzle was embedded within the lyrics, artwork, and even the musical composition of The Division Bell. Given the nature of the internet at the time and the anonymity of the poster, many fans were skeptical about the authenticity of the claims. To address this skepticism, Publius promised a public demonstration. In a follow-up message, Publius said, To validate the trust of those who have given it, I will provide a demonstration of my authenticity. On Monday, July 18th, East Rutherford, New Jersey, at 10.30pm, you will see a display of lights. 
Indeed, during Pink Floyd's concert at Giant Stadium in East Rutherford, New Jersey, on the specified date and time, white lights in front of the stage spelled out Enigma Publius while the band performed. This public display served as a validation of Publius's claims and significantly boosted interest in the Enigma. After the light display, this mystery user continued to provide more detailed and complex clues. These clues were carefully crafted to point fans toward various elements of the Division Bell. One of the notable messages said that Division Bell was not like its predecessors. Although all great music is subject to multiple interpretations, in this case there is a central purpose and a design solution. For the ingenious person or a group of persons who recognizes this and where this information points to, a unique prize has been secreted. This message encouraged fans to scrutinize the lyrics of the album. Songs like High Hopes, Keep Talking, and What Do You Want From Me were examined for hidden meanings and messages. Fans speculated that certain lines and phrases might hold the key to solving the enigma. It was also suggested that the artwork of The Division Bell contained clues. The album cover, designed by Storm Thorgerson, features two metallic heads facing each other, which can be interpreted as a symbolic representation of communication and conflict. Fans analyzed the artwork for hidden symbols, patterns, and visual cues that might relate. In addition to lyrics and artwork, it was hinted that the music itself held clues. This led fans to analyze the instrumental sections of the album, looking for patterns or sequences that might reveal more about the enigma. Some fans speculated that certain riffs or melodies might correlate with other elements of the puzzle. The messages really sparked enthusiasm within the Pink Floyd fan community. Participants from around the world began collaborating, sharing their theories and findings on forums and news groups. They dissected every aspect of the Division Bell, from the most obscure lyrical references to the smallest details in the album artwork. One message that was of particular interest said this, my friends, a recipe for a solution. Review the Division Bell material. Orient yourselves a first time, then open your minds again a second time to truly move ahead. Notice everything that has been presented since all the necessary evidence has been supplied. Direct yourselves with communication. This post was interpreted as an invitation to not just look at the album superficially, but to immerse oneself in it repeatedly, each time gaining a deeper understanding. The reference to communication resonated with the central themes of the Division Bell, which deals with the breakdown and restoration of communication. Despite the detailed clues and the concerted efforts of the fan community, the Publius Enigma has never been conclusively solved. The lack of a definitive solution has led to numerous theories about the true nature of the Enigma. Some believe it was an elaborate marketing stunt, while others think it is a genuine unsolved puzzle. There are also those who view it as a symbolic exercise meant to provoke thought and discussion about the themes of the album. The involvement of Pink Floyd's band members in this mystery has been a topic of much debate. David Gilmour and Nick Mason have both made ambiguous statements regarding the Enigma. Gilmour in particular has downplayed the significance of the Enigma, suggesting it might have been a creation of the record company rather than the band itself. Gilmour himself has been quoted saying, I know nothing about it. It was some silly record company thing that they thought up. Nick Mason has similarly hinted that the Enigma could be a marketing ploy, but neither has provided definitive answers. This ambiguity has only added to the allure and mystery, keeping fans engaged and speculative. The Xia Dynasty, often regarded as the first dynasty in Chinese history, has long been surrounded by mystery and debate. Traditional accounts credit its founding to Yu the Great. Despite its prominence in Chinese historiography, the historical existence of the Xia Dynasty remains contentious. Yu the Great is a famous figure in Chinese mythology. According to ancient texts, he was born to Gun, a hero who attempted but failed to control the flooding of the Yellow River using ineffective methods. Yu's early life was marked by the legacy of his father's failure, which set the stage for his own achievements. The story of Yu the Great is heavily tied to the legend of the Great Flood, a catastrophic event that devastated vast areas of what is now China. The flood is said to have lasted for many years, causing widespread destruction and displacement of communities along the Yellow River. Yu's success in controlling the floods had profound political and cultural implications. It is believed that his achievements earned him the Mandate of Heaven, a divine right to rule. 
this concept became a cornerstone of Chinese political philosophy, justifying the legitimacy of rulers based on their ability to maintain harmony and order. Yu's reception of the Mandate of Heaven marked the formal beginning of the Xia Dynasty. The early Tu site in Henan province is the most significant archaeological site associated with the Xia Dynasty. Discovered in the 1950s, early Tu dates back to around 1900 BCE, roughly aligning with the traditional timeline of the Xia Dynasty. The site spans approximately 745 acres and features advanced urban planning, large palatial structures, and evidence of bronze production. One of the most notable discoveries at Erlitu is the evidence of early bronze casting. Artifacts such as bronze ritual vessels and tools suggest that Erlitu was a significant center for bronze production, marking a transition from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age in Chinese history. The site also includes several cemeteries and tombs, some of which contain elaborate burial goods. These findings indicate social stratification, with certain individuals receiving more elaborate burials, likely reflecting their status and wealth. In addition to Erli Tu, several other archaeological sites have been considered in the context of the Xia Dynasty. Taosi, located in Shangxi province, is another significant site dating back to around 2600 to 2000 BCE. Taosi features large rammed earth walls, ceremonial structures, and evidence of craft production. The presence of large defensive walls at Taosi suggests a need for protection and the existence of organized labor forces to construct such fortifications. This indicates a level of social organization and political control consistent with early state formation. Taosi includes areas designated for ceremonial activities and craft production, highlighting the site's cultural and economic significance. These findings suggest a complex society with specialized roles and a hierarchical structure. While Taosi shares some similarities with early Tu, such as advanced urban planning and evidence of social stratification, there are also notable differences. For example, Taosi predates early Tu and may represent an earlier phase of cultural development that influenced the later Xia dynasty period. Other sites such as Wang Chenggang and Xinzai have also been explored for their potential connections to the Xia dynasty. These sites located in Henan province exhibit characteristics of early state societies, including large architectural structures and evidence of social hierarchy. The archaeological evidence for the Xia dynasty, while intriguing, remains insufficient to definitively confirm its existence. The debate among scholars centers on the interpretation of the available evidence and the reliability of historical texts. Proponents of the Xia dynasty's historical existence argue that the archaeological findings, particularly at early Tu, provide strong evidence for an early state-level society that could correspond to the Xia dynasty described in ancient texts. Conversely, many scholars remain skeptical of the Xia dynasty's historical existence, viewing it as a mythological construct created to legitimize later dynasties. Skeptics highlight the absence of direct inscriptions or unequivocal records linking Erlitu or other sites to the Xia dynasty. The reliance on later historical texts, which blend myth and history, complicates efforts to separate fact from fiction. The stories of Yu the Great and the Xia dynasty contain numerous mythological elements, such as supernatural abilities and divine intervention. Skeptics argue that these elements suggest a legendary rather than historical basis for the Xia dynasty. Some scholars propose that the Xia dynasty was a retroactive creation by later historians, such as Sima Qian, to provide a historical precedent for the Shang dynasty. By establishing the Xia as a predecessor, these historians could legitimize the concept of the Mandate of Heaven and justify the cyclical nature of dynastic rule. Recent geological research has added a new dimension to the debate over the Xia dynasty's historical existence. Studies led by Qinglong Wu and his team have identified sediment deposits along the Yellow River, indicating a massive flood around 1920 BCE. The geological evidence suggests that an earthquake in what is now Qinghai province triggered a landslide, creating a natural dam in the Jishi Gorge. This dam eventually gave way, resulting in a catastrophic flood that devastated downstream areas. 
The analysis of sediments deposited by the flood, including distinctive layers of green schist and purple mudstone, provides a geological record of the event. These sediments match those found at archaeological sites such as Lagia, further supporting the hypothesis of a major flood. Radiocarbon dating of charcoal deposits and human remains associated with the flood sediments places the event around 1920 BCE. This timing is somewhat later than the traditional dates for the beginning of the Shah dynasty, but aligns with the general period of early Chinese state formation. Panic in the Woods is a phenomenon that has interested and unsettled people for generations. This intense, often overwhelming feeling of fear or dread hits individuals in remote areas, prompting them to flee despite the absence of any immediate or apparent threat. Hunters, campers, and hikers are the most commonly affected, and while the phenomenon is well documented anecdotally, its exact causes remain a subject of debate among psychologists, scientists, and paranormal enthusiasts. The onset of this fear is usually abrupt and it disappears just as quickly once the person has vacated the area. Victims often describe feeling an intense sense of being watched or pursued by an unseen force. Physical symptoms can include a racing heartbeat, shortness of breath, and a heightened state of alertness akin to the body's fight or flight response. Despite the palpable terror, there are no visible threats, leading many to question whether the cause is psychological, environmental, or something more mysterious. One of the most widely accepted explanations for panic in the woods is rooted in psychology. The isolation and unfamiliarity of dense forests can trigger anxiety and panic attacks in susceptible individuals. The human mind, predisposed to fear the unknown, may amplify ordinary sounds and shadows into perceived threats. From an evolutionary standpoint, this reaction could be a survival mechanism. Our ancestors needed to be acutely aware of potential dangers in the wild, and those who responded quickly to perceived threats were more likely to survive. This instinctual response might still be hardwired to our brains, manifesting as panic in modern individuals who find themselves in similar environments. Several environmental factors have been proposed as potential triggers for panic in the woods, one of which is infrasound. Low frequency sound waves, or infrasound, are known to cause feelings of unease and anxiety in humans. Produced by natural phenomena such as wind, earthquakes, and volcanic activity, infrasound can travel long distances and is often imperceptible to the human ear. This could explain why some people suddenly feel panic in certain forested areas. Another environmental factor are magnetic fields. Changes in the Earth's geomagnetic field have also been suggested as a possible cause. These fluctuations can affect the human nervous system, leading to symptoms such as dizziness, disorientation, and fear. Areas with significant geomagnetic anomalies might thus induce panic in individuals sensitive to these changes. However, others have resorted to paranormal explanations. Many cultures have legends of forest spirits or guardians that protect the natural world from human intrusion. In European folklore, these entities are sometimes thought to instill panic in those who venture too deep into the woods. Native American stories also speak of trickster spirits and malevolent beings that lure people away from safety. Some theorists connect panic in the woods with other unexplained phenomena such as Bigfoot sightings or alien abductions. The sudden onset of fear could be a response to the presence of an unknown creature or a defensive mechanism triggered by an otherworldly presence. This ties into broader theories of strange disappearances in national parks, known as Missing 411 Cases, which documents events of people vanishing under mysterious circumstances. Hamster wheel broadcast interference refers to a potential segment from the early 2000s that was played on Nickelodeon. A user on Reddit named She's Such a Riot made a post in r slash tip of my tongue titled Nude Humans Walking Towards and in Hamster Wheels. Possible broadcast interference early 2000s. When I was about 16, I came home from hanging out with friends. I was a huge cartoon fan and still am. I grabbed some food and settled into my bed to watch Nickelodeon. 
I knew it was Nick because it was the last channel I watched that day and no one shared the TV in my room. So I turn it on to see this creepy black, white, and gray scene where hundreds of nude humans are walking in a line over these hills in the background towards these giant hamster wheels in the front of the scene. They're walking toward the wheels as a few people are already in the wheels, walking endlessly and mindlessly in this robotic zombie-like state. The people walking toward the wheels are also in this similar state as if there is no life within their eyes. They're just cold and robotic. There's this wind-like noise whistling in the background. It looks real, not animated, and as I watch in awe at this dark scene, I come to a similar conclusion and ask myself why Nick would have something so live and non-action as the entire scene keeps just repeating itself of more humans walking towards and in these hamster wheels. I start thinking, maybe it's just some weird short, and it's kind of cool in a dark sort of way. But minutes go by, and it starts to get dull watching this same scene, not doing anything else. So I quickly changed the channel to something else, when in a split second I realized, wait a minute, what the f*** did I just watch? I changed it back immediately, only to find Spongebob on the mid-episode. You could tell Spongebob was on for a while, not like the weird short played first and it just came on or anything. Freaked out, I kept going back to surrounding channels, thinking maybe it wasn't actually on Nick, but nothing had the hamster wheel video on. I have tried to research what this was for years, and never have been able to find anything remotely similar. Not sure if this was some sort of broadcast interference or something out of this world, but if anyone has any information or a logical explanation, I would greatly appreciate it. 